Unless the measuring rod is independent of the things measured, we can do no measuring. C.S. Lewis, The Poison of Subjectivism. This is Pints with Jack, Season 5, Episode 45, The Moral Argument. So Trent Horn, welcome to Pints with Jack. Thank you so much for having me. Well, I'm excited this episode because uh, we plan out these seasons many, many, many months in advance. And David is the organize, organized one, and he put together everything. And he uh, asked if I would do this one because he knows mere Christianity, the beginning part, is a lot of this moral argument. And it's one that I don't, I don't want to say I wasn't convinced with, but it was one I struggled with a little bit more. And so I think he thought it would be funny if I'm the one that has to lead the episode on the argument that I struggle with the most, which put an added pressure because as a person guiding this conversation, I felt like I had to make sure I understood all of the different uh, avenues. So this weekend I was sitting here reading article after article after article pro against and trying to just make sure I understood at least high level what but was going on. But that's also helpful for you to talk about this argument if you're not entirely convinced by it, because then you're not a yes man. And I think that's important in the world of apologetics and the world of defending the faith. You don't want to have, it reminds me of that episode of The Simpsons where Mr. Burns goes broke and uh, <laughs> he has all these advisors and stock advisors uh, with him. And all they ever do is just say, oh, that's a great decision, great decision. And he ends up in ruin. And he says, you're just a bunch of sycophantic yes men. Like, <laughs> oh, yes, we are. Absolutely. And so... Uh, but you, but in the world of apologetics, you don't want to do that. You want to test your arguments to make sure that they're strong. And I think as we discuss the moral argument, similar to the cosmological argument, we'll see it's helpful to call it the moral arguments. And that even mm -hmm. if one version of an argument is not persuasive to someone, another version of the argument may be persuasive. So criticisms don't mean the argument is bad. It just means we might have to modify it a little bit. I like that. And yeah, I'll be playing the role here of just inquisitive, asking questions. I actually, just prior to this, uh, honestly, maybe a couple hours ago, listened to the, uh, oh, what's his name? I don't know his actual name, but the Cosmic Skeptic, where you were Alex on Pines of the Aquinas. Yes. yes, Alex O'Connor. Uh, back in, I want to say it was 2020, and you were the very first debate that he had on the YouTube channel, Matt Frad did. And I really enjoyed that conversation between both of you guys. And even though you were talking much more broadly about the existence of God, a good chunk of it ended up getting into morality. And that was actually quite helpful to listen to. Yeah, I thought that was uh, one of the most fascinating parts of our exchange, that I offered a series of arguments for the existence of God, one of which was a moral argument for the existence of God. And we were discussing about the nature of morality, and we were, and I think one of the most memorable parts of the debate you know, we were talking about objective morality. Some things just are right or wrong, independent of, of human opinion. And moral dilemmas came up. And that, you know, we, and so we brought up the case, you know, if you were uh, dying and the only way to save your life was to directly kill another person, would it be moral to do that? And, and I said, well, no, it, it wouldn't be moral to do that. And uh, Alex disagreed, and we brought up the, <laughs> an issue of cannibalism in 19th century uh, seafarers, which was actually not, that was not an uncommon fear for people who were traveling the oceans in the 19th and early 20th centuries, that you would be marooned on a life raft. That was, you know, because you have very much more primitive technology back then to rescue people and locate people. And so that this was something, the Dudley case, it was the case where a group of sailors uh, killed uh, and ate one of their, uh, the cabin boy who was with them. And they were found guilty of murder, saying that, you know, murder, uh, necessity is not a defense for murder, is what they said. So the point that I was raising, I was raising is that some things just are right and some things just are wrong, even if we would very much like them to be the other way. Uh, and what explains that? And, and that is really one of the seeds for the moral argument for the existence of God. And that, and that debate was one of those moments, and I have these a lot because you, I, I, I don't know how intentional it is if you curate the, the people you debate, but you, you debate very intelligent people, which I appreciate. So you get really good sides. And he started going and saying, well, you know, that's kind of more of a fringe case, and I don't really think that happens very much. And when you started diving in and actually giving evidence of, you know, this is actually a pretty frequent thing, and, and started getting into specifics, I was oh, like, oh, yeah. wow, and, Trent's and, knowledge and, is deep. <laughs> and, that, and that's important for when you're engaging, especially when you do philosophy, you'll put forward examples or counterexamples or thought experiments, and if they're hopelessly unrealistic, 
they're not that helpful. And so, uh, but the point I raised with Alex is, yeah, you may, it's not implausible to find yourself in a situation where you're tempted to do something that is just wrong in order to secure some kind of greater good. Another example would be uh, if you are a judge or you, you are the, the warden of a jail and a mob wants to lynch an innocent person. And if you don't allow them to do that, they'll burn down the town and kill many more people. Should you let them kill the innocent person or not? Well, justice would demand that you ought not do that, even if more harm would come from the alternative. And philosophers try to explain in all kinds of different ways, well, why is that the case? You know, So there we debate about moral um, theory. So morality really has three levels. Before we get into the argument, it is important for us to understand three levels of morality. So at the, I'll start with the most uh, top level, bottom is foundational. Top would be applied ethics. Like, is abortion right or wrong? Euthanasia right or wrong? Uh, what is an equitable tax policy? What, what do we do in certain situations? Below applied ethics would be moral theory. Okay, well, what theory do we use to determine what's right or wrong? Is it utilitarianism? You know, whatever produces the most utility. Is it some kind of natural law theory? Do we do what God tells us to do, a combination? And then, so that's the moral theory. You know, what do, you know, what, do we, what framework do we use to determine right and wrong, good or bad? And then the final basement level would be uh, meta-ethics. And that would be the question, well, what is good? What is evil? Like, what is morality? Does it exist? And if it does exist, why does it exist? What is its nature? And so the moral argument really deals with that most fundamental element, that meta-ethical theory. What is morality? And given morality has a certain nature, uh, does it require a theistic or divine explanation? And I actually noticed it was interesting how I've never heard it put into those three different categories. But when, when I'm thinking back to that cosmic skeptic, skeptic conversation with Alex, uh, how much you did get to the different categories with those. Uh, and I and, and now that you put that mental template, I'm starting to think through the times when you guys started talking about uh, uh, evil is a deprivation of good. And you guys went down that path. And you started talking about that. And I think he had some pushback and you guys were discussing what that looks like. Um, and then that middle one that you just described, I remember uh, when he he started talking about because he was probably somewhat of a utilitarian utilitarian perspective. Right. I think he kind of said he wouldn't 100% fully embrace, but more or less, it seemed like he was doing that. And you mentioned, I thought this was great from the the pleasure suffering um, are we maximizing pleasure? Or are we minimizing suffering? And you started talking about, uh, well, if our only goal is to minimize suffering, God could have just created a universe with an atom and just right. kept it really simple. And I was like, huh, that is a really good point. You can't really minimize one. And, and those are kind of, and I actually made me think of Brene Brown when she talks about you can't get rid of vulnerability and have joy uh, and how those need to go together and suffering and pleasure can actually be uh, two of the same things. And so... It's right. helpful to start with that. Exactly. And so I may, I may do a whole show just on utilitarianism because it is a very common philosophy, but not one most people are willing to go 100% in on. Even Alex sees this uh, because it can lead to a lot of repugnant conclusions. Um, it can lead to defending uh, morally depraved acts if it generates more utility. And that, there's a problem right there. What do you mean by utility? Because uh, if you do it in very basic terms, like, well, whatever makes the most pleasure, because if you say, well, God should maximize pleasure and minimize suffering, you're right. Well, no, th those can go in two different directions. Uh, so this leads in philosophy uh, to something that is called the repugnant conclusion. I'm not going to go into the whole thing because that would take us too far afield. <laughs> but if you wanted to maximize pleasure, then what would be wrong with, uh, let's say, doubling the world's population, but pleasure goes down by, let's say, five, 1%. You double the population, pleasure goes down by 1%. Most people would say that, that that's a good trade-off. But then what if you just kept doing it? So you had zillions of people whose lives were just barely worth living. If <laughs> maximizing pleasure is what matters most, then zillions with a little bit of pleasure, as long as it's more than what you had before, would be justified. But most people say, well, no, life's got to be more, it's got to be more than that. 
Uh, you know, and then people will try to take other other responses to it. And like you said, if it's like, okay, well, let's just minimize suffering. We don't want suffering. Well, just snap your fingers and get rid of everything. That would be, if your goal, think about it, if my goal in, the, in life is to minimize suffering in the world, and I had an antimatter device that could destroy the universe, it would seem like morality would oblige me to destroy the universe if the goal is to minimize suffering. Uh, so, and that came up in our debate about the, the suffering of animals and whether God could allow that. So that's why it's important there in, in moral theory to figure out, okay, well, which moral theory is correct? And I do think, though, that our meta-ethical foundation is going to determine in some way our moral theory, uh, because if we believe that God is the ultimate foundation for morality, then that gives us an impetus to believe that there is a natural law, for example, that we can access, that we should follow. St. Thomas Aquinas said, the natural law is the rational creature's participation in the eternal law of God. So God has a plan for the universe, and I got a brain, I can figure that out, I can participate in it. That's natural law. Uh, and so once we, you know, as we're getting, it's funny, an applied ethic like abortion can lead us to something like a natural law, and then the natural law will lead us to the, the lawgiver himself, which is probably what we'll talk about <laughs> a lot uh, today. I like it. Before we jump into this family of arguments and starting to uh, lay this out, I do want to ask just a couple of questions from from being an apologist yourself and, sure. and all of the work you've done and what that journey's been like. And so I'm curious how you got into doing apologetic work in the first place. Like what what drew you into this? It's a hazard of being a convert uh, as someone who is, uh, and many apologists are converts because we have to assess the objections for ourselves. And once we've done that, some people want to teach others how to do the same thing, and I think I fell into that category. So I think it came out of the necessity of confronting the objections and a desire and joy in teaching other people how to do the same. And how have you dealt with, I, I don't know if the word would be convert, I was raised Catholic, but not really steeped into it, fell away, went to atheism when I was studying abroad, uh, came back to Christianity, and uh, eventually came back to Catholicism through the early church fathers, through the ecumenical council. So, so did a decent amount of diving in. And I love trying to convince people of the beauty and the truth of Catholicism, because similarly, I came to it from disagreeing with a whole chunk of it. And then when you dive into the history, you realize how thoughtful and how uh, deep the arguments go over the last 2000 years. One thing I run into the problem of is I'm super heady. I'm super rational. And so for me, creating a rational argument for the existence of, of, uh, of Catholicism or the truth of Catholicism, it's like, well, once I laid it out, why don't you convert? And I realize you know, maybe half the population is quite rational, half prefer more of an emotional beauty argument. Have you ever had that where you've had to adjust or do you just say, you know, I'm, I like to do more the intellectual argument. I like to convince from a philosophical perspective, theological, some people that works with some donor. How have you dealt with that? Well, I think that I always try to reach my audience where they're at. I mean, I speak to a diverse groups of people. Sometimes I'll address professional philosophers. Other times I'm speaking to uh, junior high students. So hmm. I always try to reach people where they're at. Uh, yeah, for a general audience, I'll include arguments, but I might also include uh, visual illustration or emotional appeal, not necessarily to be manipulative, but to help uh, a person through every aspect of their being, come to understand truth. So I'm fine doing that in a variety of ways. I really enjoy f engaging high-level philosophy. I think that's great, but I also really enjoy helping people, including you know lay people who aren't super steeped in philosophy. Uh, so I think that you can explain it to people in different ways, and people should be understanding and charitable that sometimes you know if you hear a, an apologist, especially someone with philosophical training, uh, addressing a lay audience, sometimes they will oversimplify something, or at least they won't nuance a point. And people say, oh, what about this? What about that? Well, I'm speaking to a general audience. When I'm engaging uh, a, a, another a philosopher or a more rigorous critic, then I'll have all of the nuances there. So we have to be charitable to see what was the audience a person was engaging. And in, in the last question before going into the moral argument side of things. Sure. You've been doing this for a long time. <clears throat> what to you is the most convincing argument for the existence of God? You know, if, if you had to pick one of them, I know it's a family of arguments overall and probabilistically they add up, but you know, for you, what's the one that you find the most convincing? That is a very difficult question. I'm not sure I, uh, I have it entirely answered. It's like picking my favorite argument is like my favorite child. Like I love them. Oh, I, love them I love them all in different ways. Um, <laughs> 
And I do, and it is hard because I think, you know, I like different things about different ones. I mean, my favorite arguments are probably cosmological arguments and then the moral argument. Uh, okay. And in recent debates that I've had, I really tend to focus on those particular arguments. And, and really, that was what Immanuel Kant said the same thing, uh, the famous uh, German philosopher. Uh, he said, there are two things that continue to fill me with wonder, the starry heavens above and the moral law within. Uh, and, mm-hmm. I, and I think I share that sentiment. Uh, I think the question of why is there something rather than nothing, where did everything come from? But then also, I like the moral argument, uh, and I'm glad we're talking about it, because it is a more down-to-earth argument, literally speaking, instead of just talking about contingency and Big Bang cosmology, I find it really is an immediate argument for people to assess when it comes to God. Now, it doesn't prove everything the cosmological arguments prove, like that God is, is infinite, uh, uh, you know, timeless, necessarily, you know, being eternal, uh, uh, you know, there's uh, immutable. Well, I mean, it could show those things, but not as in an explicit of a way. But I think it was very shrewd. You know, C.S. Lewis's book, Mere Christianity, is based on a series of radio addresses that he gave. And he was also doing things like giving talks for members of the Royal Air Force. And so he had to present arguments the common man could wrap his head around. Now, at that time, you could find uh, philosophers of religion, their big argument was the contingency argument for the existence of God. You can listen to Bertrand Russell debate Frederick Copleston on it on BBC Radio, and it gets very highfalutin very quickly. And I think Lewis didn't want something like that for his audience. That there, it was just his audience was not going to be able to understand that uh, very easily. But he did present an argument, and it's an argument that predated uh, him. Uh, it was something uh, Cardinal Newman had a version of it. I think there was a gentleman named Sorley who presented one, or even William Paley. But he's, he's saying, okay, look, look at the moral world around us, and we'll get to this more, what, what Lewis meant. And he could talk about things that his audience immediately recognized in their own lives, and he asked them to explain this moral understanding of the universe. And so I think that was a very shrewd thing for him to focus on. Well, that's that's perfect segue into it. Let's uh, <clears throat> let's yeah. jump into the moral argument. And uh, you mentioned it's a family of arguments. Yes. H- how about we start with uh, uh, your understanding of Lewis's version of this argument? Yeah. So Lewis's version of the argument seems to focus on well, essentially, it is asking for an explanation for moral realism. Moral realism is the view that moral propositions exist. They have a binding force upon us. They are normative, if you will. And so they exist apart from us. Um, They're not mere subjective preferences. Uh, They are not illusions. They're not errors. Uh, Moral truths exist. I sometimes like to call them moral facts. Uh, Mm -hmm. you, You ought to do good and avoid evil. Uh, you know, there's, there's these different moral facts that exist, and we seek an explanation for them. And so in things like mere Christianity, Lewis talks about how in everyday life we, we appeal to these things, not just to our preferences. So, for example, he, get, he talks about a seat on the bus. Uh, he says, you know, oh, you, you, you ought to, I gave up my seat, so you ought to do uh, similar uh, I gave you a bite of an orange, so you ought to uh, give me another bite as well. That when we're in argument with people about moral disputes, we don't just fall back on saying, well, I'm right because I feel this way and you're wrong. We don't argue about morality like we argue about sports teams or fashion. We don't just say, you know, because with fashion or sports, a lot of times it's just a preference. Well, this is better because I say so or I like it. Uh, rather, when we argue about morality, like whether it was fair what you did or not, mm-hmm. we appeal to some kind of a rule. It's like when we play a game. It's like when we play basketball, we could say, hey, that's, that's not fair, or you can't do that, uh, double dribbling or shooting outside of the boundary line or something like that. Well, why not? Well, because there's this rule that you're broke. Well, then that r- invites the retort, says who? Uh, And that's what Lewis tries to propose is, you know, well, there is this moral law that exists. What is its ultimate source? And so Lewis does uh, survey a variety of different explanations for that. Uh, I'll I'll talk about two, basically. So 
One would be instincts, uh, you know, well, uh, and, and this is something that it's funny. Lewis addresses these objections and they have persisted on. They're the same objections with you with today to, to the moral argument. He says, well, you know, the one one objection is, look, our moral feelings, you ought to do this, you ought to do that. That's just instincts we have that developed over time. We as communal animals developed an instinct to share and thrive together. And so if you don't do that, it just triggers something inside you as an animal. It's an instinct. And Lewis gives an example of, inst- he says, no, morality can't be one of the instincts. He, he agrees instincts are related to morality. Uh, however, he says, morality can't be one of the instincts any more than a songbook can be a key on a piano. So the idea here is that what is the difference between a good song and a bad song on a piano? Well, it's you hit the keys in the right order at the right time. And in order to know which ones you're supposed to hit, there has to be that songbook uh, for, you to, for you to do that. Because some instincts, Lewis says, are, are good or bad depending on circumstance. Fighting is good when you can overcome the threat, but foolhardy when you can't. And fleeing is good when you prudently need help, but it's bad if you're being a coward. So the instincts all depend on the... And so which instinct you choose is based on which key you play. You need something beyond the instincts themselves to tell you which one is right in a given circumstance. The other option might be, well, it's just society. You know, we have this social norm we've developed. I take, you gave me some of your food, I should give you some of mine. It's a social contract. But one of the problems here is that this assumes, how do we know society is good or bad? Because if we talk about social progress, we're, we're assuming things get better. Because like, we go back to fashion. Uh, people might disagree about whether fashion has progressed or not. At least we can say it's changed. Men don't wear tails and top hats. Some people call that progress. Others call it regress. But at the bottom level, it's change. It's not, yeah. but, but the fact that we don't enslave people anymore, uh, the fact that more people are equal under the law, that's progress. But then that shows that society itself can't be the standard for morality because there has to be something hmm. beyond society to judge whether society is getting better or worse, whether it's better or worse than another society that exists. Uh, so, or, and the, the problem here is the problem of the social reformer. If society determines right and wrong, then uh, whoever is in the minority is always wrong. Even someone like Gandhi or Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, would, be, uh, in, would be immoral. Uh, but they're not because sometimes society needs to be reformed. And so Lewis eventually posits that the ultimate source for, for these unchanging moral truths would have to be uh, an unchanging, perfect moral person or, or God. And how we'll circle back to, to some of those uh, sure. from the objection side of things. But let's, okay, so that's Lewis's. When you mentioned it's a family of arguments, how are some of the other ones, maybe variations or uh, related, but a little bit different from that one? Sure. Some of them might be a bit more formalized. So, mm-hmm. for example, William Lane Craig's argument, I would say, is very similar to Lewis's. It's just put in more of a, a sound philosophical argument, uh, or at least it's set in a, syllogist, in a syllogistic structure. And William Lane Craig's argument goes like this. Uh, if God does not exist, objective, morals, objective moral values and duties do not exist. Objective moral values and duties do exist. Therefore, God exists. So that is, first, it's a valid argument. Uh, (laughs) So that that would just be modus tollens. If A, then B, not B, therefore not A. Uh, If, you know, so if I am not in California, then I am not in San Diego. No, wait, no, that that wouldn't. I'm I'm using too many, I'm using too many negatives here. The point is you you can do... (laughs) The way I would do it is, okay, so if I, am, if I am in San Diego, then I am in California. I'm in San Diego, therefore I'm in California. That's modus ponens. But you can also reverse it. If I'm in San Diego, then I'm in California. I'm not in California, so I'm not in San Diego. So that would be, so Craig's using a modus tollens here. If God does not exist, objective morals, values, and duties don't exist. They do exist, therefore the first part is, is false. God does exist. So, and a lot of this reasoning would, would be similar to what, what Lewis has reasoned. Uh, and also, Craig makes a distinction between objective moral values, like what is good or bad, versus objective moral duties, what is right or wrong. Because it doesn't always follow, that just because something is good, it doesn't follow you have a duty to achieve it. 
For example, it would be good for you to become a firefighter, a doctor, a soldier, a police officer. Those would all be good things, a teacher, but you couldn't do all of them and you're not obliged to do all of them. So just because something's good doesn't mean you have to do it. Uh, so Craig makes that distinction in saying that these categories we have, things that are objectively good and bad, uh, and then other duties we have, things that we ought to do, things that we must never do, uh, this falls under that framework. And only uh, if God does not exist, these things don't exist. So there, there'll be two routes to going against the argument. We might be able to talk about this in more with objections. One would be to say morality is not objective. It is just a preference or it's illusory. Mm -hmm. The atheist J.L. Mackey once said that moral facts were so odd that uh, if they, ex they could only exist if an all-powerful God created them. So Mackey just denied objective morality, uh, the atheist J.L. Mackey. Or at least he had denied a particular form of moral realism uh, uh, regarding moral facts. So some people will take that approach and just say, well, there is no objective morality. The other approach would be to say you can have objective morality without God. And they'll try to formulate uh, different means of doing that. So that's one approach. And then I'll just briefly mention two other approaches, and then you can hash it out as you like. Uh, <laughs> another approach would be instead of a formal argument like Craig makes, uh, deductive, you could have an inference to the best explanation. This would be like someone like David, I think it's Baggett or Badgett. I, I'm really, it's always hard with these people's names. I read their books, but I don't watch videos of the people. So I, <laughs> I don't know how their names are pronounced, but it's B A G G E T T. He's written a few books with Jerry Walls on the moral argument. I'm going to say uh, Baggett, so whatever. Uh, and um, I can't call him David because I never met him. Uh, he takes more of an abductive argument. He would say, look, Craig's argument, he says it's not, he says it's sound, it's valid, it just might not be convincing to people. They might say, yeah, I still think you can have morality without God. And, you know. So what uh, Baggett and Walls say is, well, actually, maybe there's these different aspects of morality that. You know, you could have some moral things, but not other crucial parts of morality. Uh, you couldn't have moral responsibility. You know, if God didn't exist, God explains very strange features of morality, like that some things are intrinsically evil, that humans have s intrinsic worth, uh, that we have moral knowledge, uh, that we have moral responsibility. And so God explains all that very well. Atheism doesn't come anywhere close. And so we should go with God on those questions. Uh, because, and this is helpful because there are some philosophers of religion, like Richard Swinburne, who would say that maybe morality does exist out there. It's just a necessary brute fact of the universe. But I think I came across that one. <laughs> yes. This would be like atheistic Platonism or moral Platonism. The fact they're just out there inexplicably. But um, what we would say is it's very strange that there are moral agents like us to access them. So, there, you know, even if morality doesn't require God to explain its existence, it's just a necessary feature of a universe, the fact that we are moral, that we can access these moral laws and know them, uh, that we're not constrained just by evolutionary instincts, cry, is something that cries out for explanation. So a family of arguments, people can take their pick. Um, and I have dabbled in lots of different ones, and I'm actually working on a, a book on a case for Christian theism and I think in my study of the arguments, I've started out more with kind of the deductive route. Although in my book, Answering Atheism, I didn't use Craig's argument per se. It's so funny now that I've been doing this for almost 10 years, seeing how my thought has changed over time. And, and I noticed the seeds being planted in my earlier work. So in Answering Atheism, my argument was posed this way. Moral facts exist. Uh, there is no natural explanation for them. Therefore, there must be a supernatural explanation. So that was the argument that I kind of used, and, and Craig used a similar one in his debate with Sam Harris on morality. And so I think that kind of argument lends itself well to an inference as to the best explanation type of approach, to say, look, naturalism really can't explain all the rich features of morality, but theism does explain it quite well, so we should go with theism. And maybe just a quick nuanced clarification question. Sure. When... When we, we keep talking about these moral facts, these moral uh, uh, truths that we come across and we've, we've understood as time has gone on, how, how have we, out of curiosity, how have we come to like build this morality almost? Right. Is, it, is it 
like it really a good bit of it is from reading scripture and understanding the Ten Commandments from a Christian God perspective. Is it that it's been placed in our hearts? If there's a creator God, he's placed in our hearts and therefore reason has allowed us to come to it. But it's only because we can look internally and we have some sort of code in us that we just sense and our reason allows us to tease out what that sense is. Like maybe we can talk a little bit about that. Right. And so what's interesting is that the the catechism uh, talks about this with the with the 10 commandments or the decalogue as it refers to it so here is what it says in, in the catechism of the catholic church in paragraph 2071 it says the commandments of the decalogues so the 10 commandments although accessible to reason alone have been revealed to attain a complete and certain understanding of the requirements of the natural law sinful humanity needed this revelation so what's interesting here is the cat is we would say, no, people can know morality apart from God. This is a common caricature of the moral argument saying, are you where you put it this way? Are you saying a person can't be good without God? And that's, that would be a false argument. Some people think the moral argument is claiming it is impossible to be moral without God. And that's not true. There are atheists who exhibit upstanding morality. There are Christians who are quite depraved actually. So it's not the sense that you can't be good without God. It is the argument that goodness, a kind of objective goodness, cannot exist without God. There's a difference between moral epistemology, how we come to know moral truths, and moral ontology, how what makes moral truths true or what makes it the case that they exist. So I would agree that people can, and then Lewis dealt with this uh, as well, that he he ta- he actually it's so funny when you read Lewis's writings he broaches many of these same subjects he just doesn't use the philosophical jargon either because it wasn't popular in his day or he wants to be a, he wants to be a good communicator so I believe he he gives the example of a of someone learning the multiplication table that a schoolboy in England would learn the multiplication table formally through his instruction but someone on a desert island or someone who grew up in a, a you know a tribe somewhere would understand the basics of multiplication. If he has two groups of three coconuts, he has six coconuts, but he doesn't know the times tables like the schoolboy in England. But they've arrived at the same truth in different ways. But what's important here is just because they arrive there in different ways, the time, the multiplication table is not something the schoolboy and his class invented in England. They both discovered it in different ways. It exists independently of them, even though some people are more aware of it than others. And so if math, and and this is a good analog, because some people might say, well, how could morality be objective if we see moral progress? It seems like humanity throughout the past thousands of years, we make moral progress, we learn more about morality. It seems like we're just, it's like we have a car and we keep fixing it and making it better and better as if we made it. Yeah. And I would say that's not the case. We discovered it and we're getting better at discovering it. And my bet, and that's why I think the comparison to mathematics is so helpful because most people will agree. Now, there are a few philosophers, constructivists and others who would say that we created mathematical truths. But I think most philosophers and most lay people, if you ask them, did we invent math or discover it? They'll say, well, we discovered it. We can't change two plus two equals four. We discovered that. (laughs) We discovered all these mathematical truths. But if they're out there independent of us, notice we did not discover them at the same time. You know, when you, you, the axioms of arithmetic and geometry, uh, that was discovered through the work of people like, like Euclid uh, in ancient Greece. And then even going forward, it still took that over a thousand years or two thousand years to get to someone like uh, Jorg uh, Cantor. Georg? Georg? Georg Cantor. Cantor. <laughs> Cantorian set theory to deal with the infinite. Well, the truths about the infinite were always there. We just hadn't discovered them yet. And so we, we get better and better at it. And we have more of a system. But the mathematical truths preexisted our discovery of them. And I would say the same thing is true of morality. And so the, deca- the catechism here is interesting. It says you, through reason, we can figure them out, but it's very dim. We're grasping at it sometimes. Or we try to explain it away. Maybe adultery is not wrong in this case because, you know, that... Uh, a man says, well, adultery is not wrong in this case because I'm not treated well and this woman's not treated well in her marriage, so it's fine, whatever. 
so then if his reason is being numbed, you've got this commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery. And it's just black and white, here you go. And it, the, the Ten Commandments are a kick in the pants. Don't try to weasel your way out of this. So that's what it means here when it says, <laughs> by reason we can attest morality. But in other cases, God, even though we can know it by reason, there's something different when God just outright commands and tells you, do or don't do this. And it ha- that has kind of a binding uh, force, more binding force to it. So if I'm understanding this correctly, going back to before the revelation of Scripture and God came in that, like the, the time before that, and I know we have a, a very diverse listener base and some people might not think there was a time before when in the Bible, but let's assume there is and it goes back and... Well, there was certainly a time before written revelation. I mean, even if you believe... Like, think about Cain and Abel, for example. It was certainly wrong mm-hmm. when Cain murdered Abel, uh, but there had been no written revelation. There is no record in Scripture of God saying, don't murder each other either. Uh, but before this time. So there, there would have been an acquaintance with the moral law through conscience at this point. There, was, there hadn't been a, a complete uh, formal giving of the law. So it would be that word you used earlier, dim. It's on our conscience. We don't fully understand it yet. We can somewhat reason it, but then through revelation, mm-hmm. it became much clearer. Mm-hmm. Right. And it gives us more. Yeah. And also through revelation, it can encourage the will to comply with the moral law. In many cases, we do understand the law, but as Jesus said, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. We do understand it, but we don't feel an impetus to want to carry out the law's commands. Whereas having uh, that command articulated bluntly to us as like a an order, get up and go, um, that can be different. To give you an example, I have been getting healthier recently because I attend uh, classes, uh, boxing classes. My kids do wrestling Ooh, at the same time, and I do boxing. And my wife and I agreed that I am in way more shape when I attend a class than when I just go to the gym by myself. Because when you go to the gym, and it's just reason tells you you ought to, if you, if you want to be healthy, you ought to vigorously exercise. But sometimes we just walk on the treadmill and we, you know, we watch the Food Network. But when you're in a class, you have someone saying, all right, do this, do that, uh, 10 and 10, uh, shadow boxing. Uh, you know, they'll give these commands like, okay, okay, I, I, got, I got to do this, I got to do this, I got the command here. And it gives you more of that oomph to do it. Whereas if you were just relying on just your reasoning of what is good or bad for you, you might not take it as seriously. So that's another uh, reason to explain, you know, atheists say, why do you need the Ten Commandments? I know stealing is wrong. yeah until you try to rationalize it. I had a friend once who went to a party and it was for a very wealthy girl, a friend of ours, and she got a gift card for $50. And later on, a few weeks later, we were out to eat and he used that gift card to pay for his dinner. And I said, why did you do that? He said, because she's full of herself. She's, you know, she's been really mean to us lately and she's not going to miss it. So who cares? So, you know, he, he would normally say stealing is wrong, but he found a case yeah. where he could justify it. Where, so that's why I think the commands can be so helpful in that regard when we try to weasel out of them. So let me put my, let me put on an atheist hat right now a little bit. Sure. And let's, let's dive into this, this very first objective. Does morality have to be objective? This is gonna be a simplified way of explaining this, but sure. if you're an atheist and we, we just kind of talked about from a Christian perspective, we have this conscious on us mm-hmm. and then we had revelation come from uh, the creator from God and that gave us much a clearer light. Could you say, what would be the flaws of saying, okay, evolution created these instincts, which you know, to some degree feels a little bit like a conscious in the sense that there's some internal thing pushing us one way or the other. I, I mean, I know it's not the same thing as a conscious, but we're, we're learning how to act in certain circumstances for the benefit of, of society as we develop these instincts that have allowed us to evolve and get to this point without them we wouldn't have been able to evolve over the hundreds of thousands of years to get where we are today. And then as times come on, as we develop the ability to reason, we were able to rationally start explaining what are these instincts are and we can have debates. And as we've done that, we've been able to not necessarily get to objective morality, but like a, a sort of thing that feels like objective morality. Mm-hmm. And I know that's super vague to some degree. No, but like- I, I think that you, you understand. This is a common retort to the moral argument in trying mm-hmm. to deny these moral truths exist. The late atheistic philosopher, he later became a deist, actually, Antony Flew. I think one of his responses mm-hmm. to Lewis's argument 
was that, well, we just have a moral marketplace that over time people have proposed different moral beliefs and the better ones have won out. And that explains uh, the moral uh, conditions and truths that we have. And I would say once again, I mean, there's a variety of ways that one could go about um, targeting this belief uh, to say, and I guess this kind of goes back to some of the other non-standard moral arguments different from Lewis or Craig uh, this gets into the the moral knowledge arguments because even some philosophers will say, yeah, you could have morality without God, but it's very very strange that we have these uh, this moral knowledge because normally when we know things, we use one of our five senses to figure it out, or we contemplate uh, a priori truths like mathematical truths. Morality doesn't seem to be like either one of those. And so one of the arguments against moral realism, because there are atheistic moral realists, there are people who will say, yeah, morality's out there, but it's not dependent on God. One of the arguments against moral realism is the claim, the evolutionary debunking argument. And it would say, it's a, it's a really, it's, they, they would say this, that our moral beliefs are conditioned by evolution, but our evolutionary beliefs are not targeted for morality. They're targeted for survival. Because I would ask people, all right, what is morality? Like, what is it? And I guess the de basic definition you could give is this. Morality involves uh, actions that are good. Let's leave good or bad out. Uh, praiseworthy and blameworthy. Because you can have good, bad in the non-moral sense. Like, there's a good skateboard has to have four wheels and spin. You know, but just if a wheel falls off, it's not an evil skateboard. It's just a deficient one. It's bad. But a good or bad person, that's a little different. Actions that are blameworthy and, and praiseworthy uh, that, that we engage in. That seems very restricted to human beings. So the evolutionary debunking argument would say, well, morality is just, sorry, evolution is just giving us instincts to help us survive. It's, it's targeted towards survival. And it would be a gigantic coincidence if it turned out that all of our instincts for survival, that all of our survival because you could i guess i'd ask an atheist this what are survival truths let's write them all out uh don't drink what's under the sink don't play with snakes <laughs> uh you know don't there's there's all these and then um don't defraud someone because they might try to steal from you uh don't sleep with somebody's wife because the husband will try to kill you there, so you'll notice there's overlap here because i could ask you to mm -hmm. write out let's write out survival truths and let's write yep. out moral truths okay let's write them out in two lists and the objection seems to have force because you do see overlap with some of these. Okay, yeah, some of the survival truths are moral truths. But that doesn't get you all the way. The, objection, the question is, what are the odds that all of the survival truths are identical to the moral truths? And that seems incredibly unlikely, given that we could have evolved in all kinds of different ways to have different uh, things that would have been good for our well-being or not for our well-being. Because different animals, for example, engage in acts that contribute to their flourishing. Forced copulation, uh, sacrifice to save the queen, uh, you know. Different animals engage in acts that are good for their flourishing as animals that would not be good for us. But it, 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 morality, it might be different if we had evolved in different ways, but it seems like the moral truths are unchanging. They're, they're like the mathematical truths, but they're not identical to the survival truths. They don't map over one-to-one. -one. There's some overlap, but other things, like, for example, this, uh, do not directly kill babies just because they have a mild disability. You know, um, now, if a survival truth would say, uh, ensure your offspring have maximal genetic fitness. That seems like a clear survival truth that evolution would instill in us. And in the animal kingdom, it's very common for animals to leave uh, more disabled or injured young to, to care for the, the, the stronger ones that have more chance of survival. So if, if survival truths were all that mattered, you could justify all kinds of of evils. So they're, they're really not identical between the two. And so that's why moral truths cry out for an explanation beyond mere survival. Because I could say, look, you're right, we did evolve morality to get along, sure, but we also evolved mathematical knowledge to get along, right? Like if you couldn't count that there were three tigers running after you, 
and you see two run away and you're like, oh, three tigers after me, two run away. <laughs> that mean no more tigers. Well, guess what? You forgot the one other tiger and then he ate you. So I don't know why every caveman, me know two things, yellow sun and sky and yum yum donut to borrow from Jim Gaffigan. Uh, but, that's I mean. but there, there would be an example that the, the caveman with bad math dies and the caveman with good math survives. But that doesn't mean mathematical truths are identical to our survival truths because there are mathematical truths about infinity that have absolutely nothing to do with our survival. You can easily survive and thrive without knowledge of infinity. You may even do better. Who knows? But they're, they're still true and they crowd, you know. But, you know, you might say then, well, why can't moral truths be like these brute mathematical truths? That'd be the other atheistic Platonist route. And I would say, because they are imperative, they're categorical, they command me and bind me to do things, and that really only makes sense in light of some kind of authority. Uh, you know, so I might read a mathematical equation and I find it interesting. Uh, or if, if the Scrabble, you know, if the Scrabble box tips over and it says, go to store, well, that's a weird coincidence, but I'm not going. It's a Scrabble box. Can't tell me what to do. But if my wife leaves a note that says, go to store... I have an imperative there based on based on her particular level of authority and so on and so on. Is that helpful? Does that make sense? It, no, it really is. And in, in, in the end part, um, partly answered what I'm about to ask right now, but I'm, I'm just curious. Sure. You know, what if someone came to you and said, okay, in the beginning of this process, the evolutionary, you know, the instincts were 100% survival. Then we reach a point where survival is no longer quite as, uh, prominent on our minds because we have evolved enough or we've developed enough systems and processes where survival isn't necessarily the main focus. Think of like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Right. We've got the, the basic ones covered and now we're working our way higher. It could, could there be, okay, we get to that point and now we can start going and, and we get to that point and it's like, all right, now we want to go do this marketplace that you brought up and let's just have conversations. And maybe it isn't objective. We don't, maybe we don't have objective morality, but we're constantly debating. It's not perfect. We're not fully there, but at this time in society, even if some people use the language, we're progressing. Let's even take that off the table and say, you know, they're using that language, but it's not really a progression. It's just a society. We think we're in a better spot right now. We might be calling on something, but in reality, it's just a debate going on of ideas in a thousand years. It might be super different and we might even regress in some ways, although regress already kind of betrays the point I'm making. Um, I'm just curious, like if someone said that and said, but we don't, we don't need objective. It's just a marketplace subjective. It's working. It's, it's decently, it's good. Um, like what would you say is the danger of that? Does that devolve into something? Is it just not even possible to do that? Like you can't even have that argument. Well, this still, it, it under, now it's, it's moving, making progress here on the explanation to say, well, okay, morality is not identical to survival instincts, but it is just something that we create, uh, uh, that we want to move beyond survival to flourishing. And this is similar to Sam Harris's approach in his book, The Moral Landscape. And that would be the idea that, well, morality is objective. Harris wants to say it's objective, but it doesn't have a divine foundation. And more than that, Harris wants to say that science can prove moral truths. Uh, and that's very controversial. Even many philosophers will say, well, no, this goes back to David Hume, the is-ought gap. Science might tell us the way things are, but... It can't tell us the way things ought to be. It describes a system. It's descriptive, not prescriptive. And so Harris puts this forward in, uh, in his book, The Moral Landscape, and he, he talks about this, but others are, are critical of him. For example, Alex Rosenberg, in his book, he's an atheist. He wrote the book, The Atheist Guide to Reality. He says, Harris correctly explains how science can resolve moral disputes. He mistakenly thinks that science can show the resulting moral agreement to be true, correct, or right. It can't. Science has no way to bridge the gap between is and ought. So science can tell us, for example, if we institute some kind of moral policy, uh, a policy of imprisonment or taxation, or what, what are the out consequences of forbidding or permitting something, science can tell us what will be the result of that. Um, you know, it can tell us if you, lo if you do a lockdown, of businesses because of a pandemic. We now have a study to show that that really didn't decrease mortality at all, mm -hmm. for example. But then science can only get, take us that far. It can't tell us, well, it was, it was morally right to do the lockdowns or it was morally wrong. It can't bridge that gap. Harris thinks it can because 
Harris tries to define morality, he basically says it's the same, same thing as like medicine, that morality is the science of human flourishing. And he uses medicine as an, as an example that you can have objective medicine without God, you know, you, well, you cure what ails you. But here I would say that Harris has collapsed the distinction that there is a difference between morality and medicine. Uh, otherwise, morality just becomes, it's just, it's just medicine, what helps humans flourish. So you're saying, okay, it's not just survival. We also want to flourish as human beings. What contributes to human flourishing? And if something contributes to human flourishing, that is moral. And we ought to, and we have an obligation to contribute to that. A whole host of problems here. First, I would say, because some people will say, well, it's not just humans, it's conscious creatures. Uh, but I think many people, and this came up in my debate with Nathan Nobis, uh, that he had to kind of bite the bullet saying that the flourishing of a, of a rat uh, might be morally on par with a human in some circumstances. But then in other cases, he said, well, you can override the rat's right to life, yada, yada. Uh, but here it seems that, no, 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 the, the flourishing of the human species uh, is more important than the flourishing of other species. Well, why is that? Well, that's a moral fact that stands in need of explanation. Also, at the end of his book, The Moral Landscape, Harris admits that even if you had a science to figure out how human beings would flourish, that's not the same as morality. Let me, let me read to you what he, what he said here. He said, it is also conceivable that a science of human flourishing could be possible, and yet people could be made equally happy by very different moral impulses. Perhaps there is no connection between being good and feeling good, and therefore no connection between moral behavior, as generally conceived, and subjective well-being. In this case, rapists, liars, and thieves would experience the same depth of happiness as saints. It would no longer be an especially moral landscape. Rather, it would be a continuum of well-being upon which saints and sinners would occupy equivalent peaks. The problem here is that Harris has completely undermined his argument. If he says that moral goodness, if he says that goodness, the good, is identical to increasing human flourishing, then there can't be a case where those two are not the same thing. It's like when I say that um, Clark Kent is identical to Superman— there is no case where Superman is not Clark Kent. They're, they're the same. They're identical. They refer to the same thing. They just have different, they're this, they just have different reference. Uh, but Harris has conceded here that, you know, or another example would be that 2 plus 2 equals 4 means that 2 plus 2 is always 4. They're never not the same thing. But he admits here, well, goodness might not be that which increases human flourishing. And if that's the case, they're not identical. And so while human flourishing may be good in many cases, that's not what goodness is. And so that will take us back to the meta-ethical theory. What is goodness? And I would propose, I think Lewis and others would ultimately get to this point, that the good entails the way things reaching their proper end, and ultimately the highest good for all things is that which is goodness itself, or God, what the medieval philosophers would call the summum bonum, the, the highest good. Uh, and that helps to order us in understanding all these subordinate goods and provides an order and framework to make the universe morally intelligible. Could you argue, going back to your ought versus is, could you argue that we we can just let go of the ought? Like, what if, I know some people use this language, and I know, obviously, Lewis uses the ought language all the time, but what if... We just state that if you're an atheist and you're just like, you know what, it, it's honestly right now as a society, we're kind of selfishly making these decisions. We're debating them in the marketplace, but there's just, it's the ought just, we don't even need the ought um, and things are adapting and adjusting and honestly based a little bit on power, persuasion, influence, that shifting things. Like I guess in theory, you're seeing this a lot today with um the sexual revolution and you're seeing the institution of marriage really get under threat. And imagine if through the rise of social media and mimetic desire, desires slowly shift over a hundred years where there's only like five people left that really think about that. And 99.9% .9 of the world thinks like this is all good and we all accept it. And also before you know it, I don't think that's necessarily possible, but mm -hmm. do, do we have to have that ought? Like can we just let it go and, and, and just make it like a debate of ideas and whatever wins out based on power influence is kind of what, and we're adding other languages. I think to people it. can claim to want to do that. Uh, for example, David Hume said that when it comes to morality, what we mean, like, we're essentially expressing our preferences. So, like, when I say murder is wrong, what I'm really saying is murder makes me feel bad inside. 
And so if enough of us get together and say, hey, murder makes you feel bad inside too? Yeah, me too. Well, if, you know, we would all like to not feel bad inside, let's, let's make that illegal and stop each other from, from doing that. So that would be the difference between the problem here is that you could try to make morality like that, but I don't think anyone really lives that way. That when, you know, you have Richard Dawkins as a prime example of this. In his books, on the one hand, he'll say, the, in the universe, there is no good or bad. In fact, the quote is very famous. I bet I could uh, find it right now through St. Google. Well, you look that up. I appreciate every time I ask these sort of vague questions, you know exactly what I'm asking, and then you articulate it the proper way. Yes. Because so, that preferences idea is exactly what I was somewhat getting at. Yeah, and here's what Dawkins says. In a universe of electrons and selfish genes, blind physical forces and genetic replication, some people are going to get hurt, other people are going to get lucky, and you won't find any rhyme or reason in it, nor any justice. The universe that we observe has precisely the properties we should expect if there is, at bottom, no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but pitiless indifference. Everything is. There is no ought. But then, in The God Delusion, Richard Dawkins does a lot of moral whining. He says that Christians (laughs) ought to give up their belief in God, uh, that it is wrong, and I agree with him, for some religions to practice female genital mutilation, uh, that, that he off- offers these blistering commands, you ought not do that, you shouldn't do this. And so you try to say it, but you really can't live it, I think. This also brings up the difference between what would be called a hypothetical imperative and a categorical imperative. So many people who will take this route to the moral argument will say that morality is just a series of hypothetical imperatives. And you can have those without God, right? Like, I don't have a divine command. Why do I change the oil in my car? It's not because there's an 11th commandment, thou shalt change your oil every six months or 10,000 miles, whichever comes sooner or whatever. It's because if I want my car to run well, then I must change the oil. It's hypothetical. If I want X, I need to do Y. And so some people will, morality is just, well, if I want to live in a peaceful society, then I'll need to behave a certain way. And they try to make morality just a bunch of hypothetical imperatives. But I would say, no, there are hypothetical imperatives, many of them, including in morality. But there are also categorical imperatives, which are just, it's not, um, if you want X, do Y, it's just, do why. It doesn't matter if you want X. Do good and avoid evil. Don't torture children for fun. Uh, Love your neighbor as yourself. And it's just a universal and binding command that is given without that hypothetical element to it. And that, to me, becomes very difficult to explain in a universe that, like Dawkins would describe, that is at bottom, no design, no purpose, and has just pitiless indifference. I like that. And I know we're uh, pushing up on an hour here. Got a uh, one final question here. Sure. I came across this and more just your thoughts on it. Uh, not some like deep discussion, but it's something moral because God. Uh, I was hoping it is. you would bring up Euthyphro. Go right ahead. <laughs> and I actually, that's funny. You said I had no idea the uh, Euthyphro because that one I didn't get a chance to look up. You put it in the notes ahead of time. So I just threw it in theirs and I didn't realize that was the same as objective three Good, and four. Yes. But I, I had read that, and then Lewis literally writes in a letter to Mr. Bever Lewis. B- oh, Beaver Sluice. Beaver Sluice. I think I'm Beaver Sluice is his name. Yes, I want it. We actually, we should do a mega episode uh, for Pints of Jack. Let's, let's do this soon. It'll be so fun. On debunking C.S. Lewis's greatest critic. And he really is. Beaver Sluice, uh, he wrote in, I think it was 1985, C.S. Lewis and the Search for Rational Religion. He's probably one of the few philosophers who's really taken Lewis seriously. Wow. So I was wondering that, like the moral from God, apart from God, or is it because he says it? And he and Lewis takes a stance, things are not good because God commands them. God commands certain things because he sees them to be good. In other words, the divine will is the obedient servant to divine reason. The opposite view, Occam's, Paley's, I think you actually mentioned Paley's at the beginning of this, um, leads to an absurdity. Mm-hmm. So I'm just curious, like what... Is is Lewis correct on that? And like, I know nothing about that. My first instinct was if it's if it's separate from God, I mean, I guess it just seems tough for it to be separate from God, but I also see the difficulty the other way. I don't see them both ways. Right. Well, I would say that um, God in his omniscience certainly knows what is good for us and bad for different creatures and beings. So he does not command mm-hmm. things 
that are at variance with what is good for us as rational creatures. So he perfectly identifies the good. But this reply is not satisfactory to me because it doesn't show that the Euthyphro dilemma is a false dilemma. So what is the Euthyphro dilemma? That goes all the way back to Plato's dialogue, Euthyphro. And in it, Socrates basically says this. Um, well, I'm not going to use the, the... The original is, is something pious because the gods say so, or do the gods say so because it's pious? I will retranslate mm, yep. it for a modern audience and it'll go like this. Is an action is an action good because God says it's good or does God say it's good because it's good? And that leaves a problem. If, if it's good because God says so, what if God said, actually child torture is okay on Wednesdays, go right ahead. That would make God a kind of arbitrary cosmic dictator. But if he said, well, no, if God's moral commands all, it's like if he needs to consult a moral rule book to get morality right, then it seems like whatever that thing God consults, that's really God, not God. So either God, morality comes from God's uh, will, which would make it arbitrary, and it's not, or morality is completely beyond God, and he is subservient to it, which means he's not really God, it's beyond him. And It's a good formulation. Yeah, and so the reply that I would prefer to the dilemma is to say, a thing is not good because God says so, and, do, and God doesn't say so because it is good. Rather, God says so because he is good, or he is the good. So God's commands flow from his nature. So morality does not come from God's will, it comes from his nature. And from a Catholic mm. perspective, I think this is helpful because we have a robust theology. We talk about divine simplicity, God's in infinite nature. God is just perfect being itself. If evil is an absence of good, and since God is infinite, undivided being itself, God by necessity must be good. He's, he can't be bad. He doesn't lack anything. He's infinite, undivided being itself. So if God is the good, then we, we've been able to split the horns of the dilemma. What he commands will be necessarily good. It flows from his character. The Catechism puts it this way in paragraph 271. God's almighty power is in no way arbitrary. And then it quotes Aquinas. In God, power, essence, will, intellect, wisdom, and justice are all identical. Nothing, therefore, can be in God's power which could not be in his just will or his wise intellect. So that's what I believe is the key to splitting the horns of the Euthyphro dilemma. Uh, it's not good because God says so, uh, and it's also God doesn't say so because it's good. God says so because he is good, the goodness itself. So, and he's the, he's the natural stopping point. It would make sense here. It, to give you an example, uh, before they changed it using the speed of light and I think cesium atoms, uh, what makes something a meter long, right? Is it a meter long because, uh, you know, how, how do we know something is one meter in length? Well, we know something's a meter in length because traditionally there was a bar of iridium and platinum in, in France called the meter bar, and that bar was the standard for how long a meter was. Now, it wasn't exactly <laughs> a meter, so they've changed it with, um, I think, radioactive decay and, and speed of light, things like that that are more precise. But it wouldn't make sense to ask, well, how do you know the meter bar is a meter long? How do you know? If, is something a meter because the bar says so, or does the bar say so because it's a meter? And you would say, no, both of those are wrong. It's a meter long a meter. <laughs> because it matches the bar, and the bar just is what a meter is. And so that can help us to see how God's relationship to morality is not arbitrary or subservient. It flows from the fact that God just is goodness itself. And so morality naturally flows from his perfect divine nature. I like that meter analogy. That's beautiful. Yeah. Clear, simple. And, and that's to, to, to pull... And actually... That goes back to the quote, I believe. Maybe you could read it from the very beginning of when we were speaking uh, about yeah. the rod. What, what did, yeah, could you read that again? Because that kind of ties up everything that we began with. Unless the measuring rod is independent of the things measured, we can do no measuring. That's right. So that makes sense. If the meter was a part of the thing that you measured, you couldn't you know, uh, know what was a meter long or a foot long, whatever it may be. It has to be a sta standard that's outside of these things that we can consult. 
And so that would be uh, similar to God. And so once again, yeah, it's important to use analogies, and that's where Lewis really excels as an apologist in creating these memorable analogies to help people understand. So, hey, that worked out well. We brought it full circle. I like that. That's good. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad I stuck with that quote now because I almost did this one from David, Proverbs 18, 17, because I had just listened to the first 15, the debate you just did with... Um, oh, Steve Christie. Yeah. He went first, if I'm correct. And I remember hearing, I'm like, oh, these are some pretty good arguments. And I, I literally text David this and... And then I go, oh, good, Trent really uh, addressed those well. And he goes, the one who states his case first seems right until the other comes, comes forward and challenges him. him. Yes. <laughs> yes. And I, and I always feel that whenever I'm listening to your debates, because I listen to the, the first person, I'm like, huh, this is going to be a tough one. And then you're kind of unfazed and you come with all the responses. I'm like, I love it. Absolutely. So beautiful. Well, this was awesome. Super helpful. I'm glad we're able to dive in, especially to that part at the end with the the... Uh, subjective part and the evolutionary side. Those were uh, a lot of thoughts that I had and even wrestled with. And so um, I appreciate that. And uh, actually was quite convincing as well. And so thank you, Trent, for coming on the show. Happy to be here anytime. Yes. And before we sign off, you know, since the last time you've been on here, any um, ways that people can find out more about you, some of your conversations, your debates, your books for uh, new people who haven't heard some of your previous ones with us? Well, I'd recommend that they check out my podcast, The Council of Trent, C-O-U-N-S-E-L, on iTunes and Google Play and YouTube. And they can also visit our website at Catholic Answers at catholic.com. And I have my own website, trenthorn.com. Beautiful. And guys, I can't recommend enough the book, Why We're Catholic. It's such a good tool for wherever you are on the spectrum in the beginning part, whether you believe in the existence of God or not, Christianity, Catholicism. I think, uh, Trent, you do a fantastic job really just being able to hand that to anyone where they are on the journey. And I think that's fantastic. Uh, everyone, please join us next time uh, in Apologetics Month when we'll be going further up. And further out. Oh, I should have told you. Oh, no. I, <laughs> I should have told you further out. To in. infinity and beyond. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say we'll cut it and redo it, but I really like that no, to that's infinity fine. and beyond. Yeah. That's fine. <laughs> let's, try, let's try it again. What would you like me to say? Please join us next time when we'll be going further up. And further in. Cheers. Cheers. Hey, thanks for watching this video. If you want to help us produce more great content like this, be sure to click subscribe and go to trenthornpodcast.com to become a premium subscriber. You'll help us create more videos like this and get access to bonus content and sneak peeks of our upcoming projects.